that's not easy. Okay, the class only dropped by 5% after one election. That's not bad. <laughs> so it's going to be a bigger throw up after this. <laughs> All right, so now we go into the, the nitty gritty of this, and we, you, you actually discover that this is a lot about statistics and linear algebra and captions. <laughs> and uh, that all depends. Um, uh, an important thing to know, uh, the more mathematics you can take, the better. Uh, but again, this course will, will be focusing on practical skills, and the practicals are very important. Um, nonetheless, if your linear algebra is rusty, I strongly recommend that you Google linear algebra. <laughs> <laughs> uh, linear algebra lectures, and you can take Gilbert Strang online linear algebra lectures, or you can go to what's that famous instructor? He's really good online. Kant's Academy. Uh, yeah, so, yeah. It, it, it's got brilliant lectures on linear algebra in case it's rust to just go back there. And calculus as well. So, important things um, that are essential for taking this course um, in terms of mathematical background. You have to know what a vector is and what a matrix is. So, these are very important skills. Um, I mean, just sort of basic background. If you don't have that basic group background, you don't know what a vector or a matrix is. Then there's uh, Khan Academy, there's Gilbert Strang Lectures, so you can just Google linear algebra, go to Wikipedia, everything is in Wikipedia. Um, that is background for this course. Um, some very basics of statistics, like for example, for next week, we're going to go into Gaussians and multivariate Gaussians. Gaussians are more than one dimension, so they're extremely useful, and so. So the basics of probability and statistics are essential as well. Um, and again, if you're basic, you haven't had a, an introductory course in probability and statistics, again, there's very good ones um, for the undergrad level online. Um, and finally, calculus. Um, one of the key methods for learning that we will use here is something called gr uh, gradient descent, uh, which is optimization by going downhill. So, how many of you ski or snowboard? Um, hey, nice. If this was my class in Vancouver, everyone would be. <laughs> Actually, the class would be half empty because half of the people would be up on the mountain snowboarding. <laughs> um, but um, it's just, learning is just like snowboarding. Just um, look for the steepest descent and go for it. And so, put your foot in front of the board and enjoy it. Uh, that's pretty much the steepest descent is in local where it's really steep and go in that direction so the double black diamond or, or where they tell you not to go that's what it's about um, don't take this as advice <laughs> okay uh, so, and, and, and that's basically calculus is something called gradients, and you need to know that concept. The, the, the root of this, uh, a lot of the things that we're going to do will be about uh, differentiation. We'll try to build machines, um, and, and essentially what we try to do is build machines that we can differentiate. If we can differentiate, we can find our optima, uh, optimum operation. So we can take a Turing machine, and if you can differentiate a Turing machine, if you build a differentiable Turing machine, you can build a Turing machine that learns from data. Um, if you can take a graphics engine, something that generates graphics movies, and you can make it differentiable, and you can generate movies. If you can do that with speech, you can generate speech. Um, um, so basically, if you take any machine, make it differentiable, um, make it learn from data, and now it can adapt. That machine can adapt to the world. So derivatives are extremely important. Um, go revise gradients. Gradients are very important. Um, we're going to get into them next, uh, not next week, the week after, but they will be essential. And only they will touch on them today. Okay, so but this class now is going back to some very basic statistics, and we're going to look at something called linear regression. Um, <coughs> And we're going to try to understand it, and uh, this is actually something that's also known as least squares. Um, we're in the set, uh, the setting of what people folks call supervised learning, in the sense that there is inputs and there's outputs. 
And there's the teacher uh, gives you, for each input, shows you what the output should be. Um, if this is an image of a cat, the output should be the label cat, um, and so on. If this part of speech is, to, uh, is say, chameleon, the output should be a string of characters that say chameleon, um, and so on. Um, there's many ways in which, so there's also, in learning any new field, there's, there's language associated with it, there's also parlance. Um, and inputs are often known as covariates, that's in statistics, uh, or, or they're also known there as predictors. Um, we often call them features, or we call other things features as well, but in, often the inputs are called features. Um, the outputs are variates, things that vary depending on the input. Um, they're called targets. You're trying to learn some target uh, class, or they're known as labels. And I'm sure there's many other words by which these get referred to. But uh, interchangeable, we'll probably use these terms. Um, inputs, outputs. Um, and so, in the first thing in linear supervised learning, we assume that the relation between the input and the output is linear. So, if you are in one D. It would be a line, it should it would be a plane in high dimension, it would be a plane in high dimensions. But there's a sort of linear relation between the input and the output. Not very exciting because it's just well, line is just basically saying if you increase the x, you increase y if the slope is positive. But what we learn here will be useful later. Um, and in particular, um, a lot of processes, basically pretty much everything in life is nonlinear. But, um, uh, but if you look at it locally, sometimes it's linear. So by linearizing in a local region, you can actually design very nice machines. For example, machines are able to land automatically uh, from the sky, and you owe your lives to these machines um, um, if you've taken a plane before. And so linearization is very useful um, in engineering. And, and so knowing how to play with linear models it turns out to be useful. Um, also, you'll see that most of these models have as a sub-module a linear module. So if you can use linear modules, uh, if you can understand how these sub-modules work, then you can um, take advantage of them to build large, large architectures. Um, linear models are also nice because I can teach you the, con the basic concepts of uh, statistics um, uh, with them because I can do everything by hand. So all we need is a piece of paper to do this. We don't need computers or computing. Later we will not be able to do things by hand. Um, but the same uh, principles about learning that apply to these models that we will discuss next week apply to non-linear models. Um, so, so it's saying here we'll learn the basic concepts. So, okay, so how does um, it uh, work? So the setup is the following. We're going to keep it. Um, we're going to start like sort of start introducing some um, um, notation here. We're going to be given uh, what I call the training data set. Uh, training set <coughs> that will contain uh, n instances. So these instances could be pairs of images and their label, the text label that says what the image is about. Um, and so the inputs will be the axes, and the labels will be the outputs. Now, I will use this notation where x1 colon n basically is a set which is, includes x1, <coughs> x2, all the other x's up to xn. Okay. So it's just a shorthand notation for all the x's. x that indicates how many there are. Um, each of these x's could be, for example, a vector with the components, and that's what I mean by this um, here. I just mean a, a vector of numbers that are essentially d numbers, and those d numbers happen to be real numbers. Um, it could it could be other things. It could be binary numbers um, indicating whether you prefer something um, or not. Um, the, you know, categorical variables and so on. But let's say they're just D numbers or um, the inputs, the attributes, as they also know, the predictors. Um, 
the output is going to be the target, and we are, we are going to assume for linear regression, for simplicity, that the output is just going to be one single real number. Okay. The inputs, in a sense, could be integers, there could be other things. Um, but that's sort of not too important. So let's look at an example. Um, an example might be something like this. We're given a table of data, and this is what this data set might look like, where we have um, the wind speed outside this building, and we have the temperature inside this building, and then what we would like to do, um, right now what we're doing is we're opening these windows by hand to control the temperature in this room, but imagine that we wanted to improve on that, and we wanted to put an automatic thermostat in this room, that would detect how many people walked in the room. So it would know how many people are inside here now. It would know what the temperature outside is because of the wind speed. And then it would automatically predict uh, what is the energy requirement to keep this room at a comfortable temperature. Okay, so in this case, this is, this is the, so this would be, x1, and this would be y1. So I want my model to, given the speed of the wind measured outside by some meteorological station, and given a, a counter that just counts by some sense of how many people have walked into this room and walked out, um, and would automatically be able to predict what the setting of the thermostat should be. Okay, so to regulate the temperature so that we're comfortable. Okay, so, so the inputs are the x's, the output is the y. We would like to learn this model, because if we do learn this model, then this thermostat will solve our problem. It will just adjust the temperature based on how many people are here, and based on the temperature outside. And if that works, we, um, then we'll all be, we'll be happy than having to open the windows manually. Um, so that's x1. x3 would be this vector. And this would be y3. Okay, so in this case, in particular, d is equal to 2, as you can tell, and there are four data set instances. There are four, um, there are four rows of the data set. Um, so that's a simple form, a uh, simple data set, but already if we could um, um, know how to manipulate this data set, we could build useful technology. Um, and so, in particular, you know, as I mentioned, given now a different number of people and given different temperature measured outside on any arbitrary day, I would like to automatically predict what the temperature, uh, w what the energy requirement is in the thermostat so that this room is at a nice temperature. And so, um, we're going to do this in two stages. And this is going to be true of always in supervised learning. So the first stage is going to be called, um, I will refer to it as training. Statisticians call this statistical estimation and so on. Um, the idea is, um, given the data, and the data is essentially that table of numbers, which has n um, x's and n y's. The y's are one column, the x's could be several columns, the columns in total. This gets put as an input to what we're going to call the learner. And what we're going to learn is a, is a model. Quite often, and it will be the case in this course, not necessarily always, but certainly in this course, um, the model will have parameters. So statistics is a very vibrant area for certain so non-parametric uh, statistics. Um, I will not be covering it, but um, that area is so very big here at Oxford as well. There's people like you, I'd say, in statistics, Michael Osborne in engineering, so that all do excellent work in that area. Uh, Frank Wood as well, so I recommend you attend their courses if you want to learn about that. But here I will focus on models that have parameters. I will, however, let this number of parameters be very large. 
So the models would be in a sense non-parametric because in, in the sense that the parameters would be a billion parameters and so on. The models will be so large that you will not be able to sort the parameters in a machine. You really need a server with several machines and you need to have some very interesting architectures to be able to, smart architectures to distribute the vector parameters. That's like how most recognition, image recognition systems work at companies. You need uh, what people call a parameter server uh, to just handle a single recognition model. Um, I often use the, the Greek letter uh, theta or theta uh, to, um, to describe the model parameters. Uh, for linear models, in the simplest form, a line, the parameters are the intercept and the slope. So learning is just computing the intercept and the slope of the line. It's basically learning the plane. If you can learn the plane, you've learned. Once you have the plane, you're going to take a new data point, and this is what I'm going to call testing. Or prediction. <coughs> so the new data point goes into the predictor. The new data point and the learned parameters go into the predictor. And they generate a prediction. And I'm going to put a hat to indicate a prediction. So the hat denotes prediction, and it's the prediction for that point, <coughs> which I will write either like this, or like, write it as a, you know, it's a function of the input. So I could write it like that as well. So the idea is, during training or learning, um, I can put here learning, uh, we estimate parameters from a data set uh, with n instances, and during prediction, uh, we use the estimated parameters, the model that we've learned, to make decisions to make the forecast. Um, as we will see, I mean, this is the first way we're going to do this. As we will see later, this can happen in an online fashion. You're adapting the model in the latest time. So most of the things that we do have to be adapted, in fact, as a data. Because there's just too much data to load the data to memory. Um, so you really have to learn with small batches so they can be able to update them. And how big the batches should be, that depends on statistical conservation, but it also depends on um, a lot of systems constraints in terms of communication, access to this, how much it costs to send things over the net, how much memory can you press your GPU you have, and so on. Okay, so let's look at the first linear model. The first linear model is a line. It has intercept theta 1 and slope theta 2. Um, the input is just one variable. In this case, d is equal to 1, just one column, and then the output is also just one column. Um, and the, when we do learning, we also need to specify um, what I call an objective function. <coughs> objective function. Some people call it an energy and or a loss. Um, it's something that measures how well you're doing. So in supervised learning, you want some function that will tell you whether you've, you've done good learning or not. Um, and let's look at one example. So one example could be, um, you know you've done well, if the difference between the true data in the training set, so the y's that you have in the training set, are close to the predictions that you make in the training set. So basically you train, you learn theta, once you do theta, um, you multiply your theta times the x in the training, and you compute the y hats. And if your y hats are close to the y's, then that error is going to be about zero. And Gauss came up with this 300 years ago, and it worked uh, for a lot of problems, and it became very popular. It's very analytic, very tractable, and we use it because of that, even though it's very uh, it's dangerous, as I'll soon show you. 
But um, basically, graphically, what we're saying we're doing here is we have a function um, with uh, x axis x and with the height of the y's, and um, we're given some uh, data points. And what we are doing is we're fitting a line to these data points. And the way we're fitting this line is we're fitting in a way, like a good way to think about this, uh, we're, we're right across from Hooks, um, uh, Robert Hook's building, so um, it, it only befits this place to use springs. And think of Hooke's law. And remember, there was a kx squared, the squared. Um, and so, one way to think about this, and it has the energy, kx squared, <laughs> is that if you imagine that each of these red dots, and I should say what these red dots are, uh, so the coordinates are basically the data points. So this would be x1, this would be, say, x3. I mean, there's no, the data is scrambled. There's no particular order. So I'm emphasizing that by writing it this way. And this height here is the corresponding height y1. This is the corresponding height y3. So that's the data. The data is these red dots, and those are its coordinates. Um, this line, which is our model, has slope theta 2, and the height of the intercept is theta 1. Okay. Um, and this difference here is what we want to minimize. If this is y4, height y4, um, this guy here is the prediction y4. And so this gap here is y4 minus the prediction of y4. And we use squared because we're using springs. We're trying to minimize the energy. We're trying to find a minimum energy configuration for this uh, line. So if you were to... And you actually can actually implement this with springs if you want. Um, and so basically if I try to twist the line and I let it go, it will sort of converge at one point of minimum energy. And there is only one such point, as we will see soon. And uh, that's essentially um, how this works. And this works extremely well. A lot of science is based on this. And there's all sorts of things with this. And there's millions of papers out there using this model to describe some sort of date. Turns out to be a very useful model. Do you directly touch the screens? Basically, uh, here we're measuring the distance to the y coordinate and not the distance to the line. So the screens would have to be somehow made to always stay vertical. Ah, right. This is very important. That's the first dangerous thing about this model. It's not, uh, why should we prefer for it? So anyone looks at this, that's a bit of computer graphics, we made it all, a little bit of common sense, but so why don't we measure it like this? That would be better. <laughs> um, but it's cool we always see the vertical one, because um, that's what we uh, like. Um, so it turns out that this indeed is, people do this way. Anyway, in the next class, we're going to go over and look at measuring things this way. That's going to give rise to total these squares and so on. Um, one of the big problems with these models as well is you might have data that looks like this. Okay, so when you would like your line to be going to the points, but because, but then this fails, because what happens is when you have something that looks like this, this spring is really stretched. And when you have a spring that's really stretched, even if it's only one spring that's very stretched, it completely destroys the line. You'll end up with a fit to the data that looks like this, just because of that one spring. 
And that all comes because of our choice of uh, metric. Um, so we will learn other choices throughout the course. And so this is always, um, this is um, something that you need to think about carefully for each problem. What, what kind of metrics should I use? And in fact, coming up with good metrics is one of the most fundamental problems, um, I think, in, in um, uh, certainly in, in the whole scheme of federal intelligence machines. Um, I think a big part is learning with, with metrics. So, so if you generalize it to higher dimensions, then you would have, um, we move on to instead of just having um, theta naught plus theta one times x one, you would now have many, um, you have d thetas. So you have um, x uh, i one theta one plus x i two theta two all the way to x i d theta d. So for each theta point, the prediction is you would use a plane to make a prediction. And as a convention, we typically set this first guy always to be 1. Because then that gives us the offset, so that gives us the bias term. We, we, we call it the bias uh, term, so it's, it's basically this guy here. So as you can see, there is a 1 here. That changes the height of the line, the height of the plane. Matrices are great for this because instead of writing all these sums and uh, details, we can just group all the various variables into a single data structure and we can just manipulate the data structure because the data structure has all sorts of properties that um, we've studied for centuries. Um, and so we can write this model instead of writing it component wise, instead of expanding it like this or writing it using these sigma notations, these loops. Uh, we can just try to very succinctly uh, the matrix representation this way. And so that basically says that, as you can see, I, I goes from 1 to n, so you have I1 to I n, um, and x goes from 1 to d, and then you have d parameters. So we can group this in a single. Um, so the linear prediction is you just multiply matrix of the input data um, times your vector parameters, and that's usually up. Let's look at an example. Um, back to our, our thermostat design. So we have two inputs, the wind speed and the people inside the building, and we're trying to predict the adjustment of the thermostat, how much energy um, needs to be injected into regulating this rule. And so in this case, um, as you can see, the y is this vector, so that corresponds to what I've drawn here, and um, the x, which corresponds to these four columns, is what I've put in here. So I've just copied it. So if your data is stored as a table, it's very easy to form these matrices. Um, and then in order to compute the parameters, you need to just multiply this table uh, oh, hang on, I haven't told you how to do the parameters, that's coming soon. Um, but if you want to uh, compute uh, the y, so basically the model is y is equal x theta, you would multiply this x times this vector, and that would give you y. We still don't know how to get the thetas, how to compute the thetas from data. But we already know the loss. We're going to try to minimize quadratic loss, the Gauss loss. And so in particular, let's assume that our theta by, suppose you, you, someone come and give you that theta, some barn machine already gives you a theta, then in order to make a prediction on the training set, in order to generate the y hat uh, from 1 to 4 on the training set, we will basically take the, the data again, x, and you would multiply by theta. So x times theta, that's going to give you predictions y, and now you get y hat, and now you compare y hat to y, and you sum all those uh, square differences, and that tells you how well you're doing. Okay, so that's how you would make predictions. So let's have the theta, uh, a single value, a single vector, theta, can make any predictions. 
So the question is how do we get that theta? Um, uh, or, yeah, so this, uh, again, you can predict, those predictions here should have added, these are predictions on the training set, um, but ultimately you want to get new data that you have not encountered before in the training set, and you want to make predictions there, and hopefully those predictions will still be good ones. So if I have a new x vector, I, I add it to that matrix, and I multiply times my vector of features, and, um, and that's how I compute a prediction. This is essentially mathematically the same as evaluating the line at that point. Okay, so um, just like I vectorized the description of uh, a line, instead of using the sum or, or a loop and code, I'm going to use just a direct operation. Um, so this is important not only to shorten the math and in order to derive things more quickly, but this is also <laughs> essential to get a code that runs fast. Um, you have to vectorize code when you're doing lots of loops. and Because um, um, we have very good libraries these days to deal with um, matrix operations, so we can take advantage of that. Um, so um, this quadratic, so the quadratic form the sum of square losses can be very compactly written as this. And to see that, the first thing you should uh, note is that if you have a vector, um, here I'm using both for vectors, by the way, and non both for um, scalars. And so matrices are typically um, capitals in both. And so this is a matrix times a vector. I'll use a bar when I write. Um, and so to see that this is true, well, um, if you have vectors, um, if you have a vector x that has entries x1 and x2, um, and a vector that has entries y1 and y2, then you know that uh, x transpose, um, actually let me transpose these, so x transpose y, it's just x1, x2, y1, y2, and that's just equal to x1, y1 plus x2, y2, and that's equal to uh, sum over i, xi, um, about the transpose, xi, yi. Okay, and so. It's a trivial exercise for you to then go and rewrite uh, this as this, because essentially, um, if you, let's say, look at this, what we have here is a vector of y1 all the way to yn, minus, um, and then you could write which of these is x1 transpose, x2 transpose, all the way up to xn transpose, each of these x vectors has the components, um, and it multiplies the vector theta, which is in this case a vector with one component. So that corresponds to so this term corresponds to this term here. I'm going to let you fill in the, the remaining steps. Okay. Um, to convince yourself that you can rewrite um, um, this expression in matrix vector in that form much more efficient. So the dot product, as you can see here, what I'm doing is I'm taking a dot product between this vector and this vector, which is the reason why I get the square here. Um, if it's the same vector, x dot x transpose x is just the sum of the xi squared. Um, and then I just need to break this into its various components to actually identify the vector. Uh, and so from now on, I'm going to use this form, because it turns out that this form is a lot easier to manipulate than to be using these sums and these loops. Now, you can also plot this function. Like, for example, if my theta is two-dimensional, so in other words, I only have two parameters in the model, theta 1, theta 2, so back to the line, intercept and uh, slope. Or maybe I choose not to have an intercept and I have a plane going through the origin, and then I just need to choose its two angles, theta 1 and theta 2. 
This is a quadratic function, so it's a ball. And in fact, it's uh, it's a ball. And if I were to cut it, uh, if I were to slice it uh, from um, what I would get is ellipsis. Um, so these guys, at which the height is the same, these curves here, these are the the contoured curves. These are the lines at which you're at the same height. You're at the same cost. So if you follow this line, your cost doesn't change. You're always at the same cost. Your objective is to go to a lower cost. So learning is about doing this. Most important thing I've said today. <laughs> it's the snowboarding thing. If you go perpendicular to these lines, if the lines are the constant height, if you go perpendicular to this line, that you pick in the direction of steepest descent. Actually, the gradient is this mathematical function, it's a vector of derivatives of this function. It's a vector of derivatives, and it exists at every point. These little arrows here in blue, these are the gradients. The gradients point outward. You go in the opposite direction of the gradient when you go to the minimum. If you want to go to the op if, if the function is flipped and there's a maximum, which usually happens with probabilities, you want to maximize probabilities, you follow the gradient to the top. And that's essentially what we're going to do all the time, follow gradients up and down. That's going to be our mechanism for learning. If we know that the loss is this ball, then we know we know a ball only has one point, that is the optimum point down here. So we know if we follow the gradient, if you go downhill, you're going to get there. It's impossible to get anywhere else. With a bit of math, you could formalize the proof now, that you have a dentition. Um, it turns out, well, so then to find a solution, to find the optimal theta, is just a matter of differentiating. So you can do it in two ways, like in this case. Um, what I would do is I would take the derivative um, of this, uh, I would take the derivative of j of theta with respect to theta 1, and then I would take the derivative of j of theta with respect to theta 2. Okay. This would give me um, some function with two, uh, so an equation with two variables. Um, this would give me another equation with two variables, two unknowns. So basically a function of two, vari uh, with two, uh, two equations with two unknowns. Um, these are called the normal equations. They are described at length in the Wikipedia page. So if you do least squares, if you Google least squares wiki, um, you'll get the details of how you would do this. Um, it's very tedious. I'm not going to do it this way. I'm not going to make you go through that this painful exercise. There is a fast way. You learn, you Google matrix differentiation, and you learn that you can differentiate with respect to matrices and vectors and you spend some time learning these rules, and you learn that, oh, the derivative of a matrix times a vector is just a matrix transpose. And for a quadratic, this is the expression. And then you realize that there's a field of algebra called matrix differentiation, uh, which has chronic products as all of these things. We're not going to need to go and look into that, but I can tell you that the basic data structure of the language we use in this course, uh, Torch, is a tensor. <laughs> And so it really helps you to uh, learn a little bit about this. So Google Matrix Differentiation, there's very nice Wikipedia pages on this. Um, and the nice thing about this is it allows us to do things quickly. Instead of me trying to solve um, all these equations that figure out how to solve them, um, I can just um, look at the derivative with respect to the entire vector 
of the expression of the cost and what I can do is I can expand it by just multiplying terms <coughs> and I have minus 2 y transpose x theta plus theta transpose x x theta so this is where linear algebra comes in uh, you need to remember how to, what transpose are and how to multiply matrices and so on and how to invert matrices, never divide by matrices, that sort of thing. Very essential. So basics of linear algebra are useful. But once you have them, you can do these calculations very quickly. Um, and, oh, by the way, who knows why I grouped the two terms, the two cross terms into a single term? It's a scalar. Another piece, very important thing to do is always keep track of the dimensions, both in the code and when you do math. Always keep track of dimensions. And that's what they need to transpose up to the to the x on that There you go. I would have got it by looking at the dimensions. <laughs> so these are the dimensions of each of these quantities. Keep track of them. No, no, I'm sorry to interrupt, but the, your x's are column vectors, but when they're in the matrix, they're as rows, is that correct? Yeah, I, yeah, yeah. I, uh, I think the way I define them, and it varies according to the lecture, I think I've defined them, <laughs> I've defined them this way. Because I started, I wrote them as, um, I wrote them initially as rows, it's all about definition. If I, if I define them to be rows, then... Um, like then I'm defining them to be factors, so I have to transpose to make them rows. Um, and if I define them as columns, then but that's a good point. If sometimes those things are not clear, just uh, let me know, and, uh, and we'll fix those transposes. And then if you do this, then you apply the rules of differentiation. You get zero. Um, you get um, sorry minus two. Um, um, x transpose y, and then you get plus x transpose x theta. We equate to zero, um, and then we get that theta is equal to x transpose x inverse x transpose y. And that is the solution. So you can calculate this very easy. So if you have the tables in Torch, you have the tensor. You just transpose it, multiply, invert that, multiply times x, multiply it by the vector of y, and that's theta. That's how you learn. So in this case, you don't need to follow gradients. I can do this by hand. That's why linear models are popular, because you can do them by hand. Um, one problem with this is it requires that you load all the data. So this is easy until you have to invert a matrix that's a billion by a billion, and this approach sort of collapses. And then the other problem is a lot of the times this matrix is ranked efficient, so you will not be able to invert it. Um, very quickly to finish uh, this lecture, um, so we will be using Torch 7. So you can Google Torch 7, that's what we'll use for this course. Um, basically because every neural network that we'll discuss in this course is already implemented there. You can reuse it, you can do new things with it. It's a very nice library to manipulate this. And as I mentioned, it's a library that is um, heavily used at, um, I think some of the companies are sort of doing groundbreaking work in machine learning. So if your intention is to get a job in one of those, then I strongly <coughs> suggest you learn this. Um, and also because it's a new language for everyone, this is, for those of you who have, an, who have a background in neuroscience or mathematics and you're learning to program, this is a very easy language to learn. And it has very little in it. Um, it's an extremely dangerous language, though, but it's one that's very easy to learn. Um, Brandon will be doing the exercises, pointing out the dangers. Um, but so in Torch, the first thing you would do if you're doing, like in this case, we're trying to predict corn yield based on amount of fertilizer and insecticide. You would load the data. Um, I will make these slides available so you will have these links so you can actually, this tutorial exists online. Um, you load the data, you basically form a matrix, or uh, in this case a tensor, which is um, a outer product of two vectors. Uh, you could scale this to higher D because like a video has X, Y, and Z. So we like tensors because we like to look at data that has 
more than just two facets that has many possible facets. Like a video has three, but you can imagine that a lot of data, like in recombination and so on, could have easily a thousand facets and so on. So it's good to manipulate tensors. <clears throat> um, this is how easy you build that model. You basically say the model is sequential. We're going to do this as a neural network. It's going to have inputs x1 to xd. Um, each input will be feeding into uh, a linear, what our sort of really abstract model of what a neuron is, um, computational unit that is linear, and that's going to make a prediction y hat. And basically it has two inputs. It has one output. That's how you specify the model. When you specify the model like this, Torch knows that you're talking about this model. That's linear regression seen as a neural network from a neural network perspective. It's just a single unit that has a linear response um, to the input. And each of these things here is basically weighted by a parameter. And typically in Torch, even though it's not uh, made explicit here, uh, one of the inputs x1 will be set to 1. So you will have a bias term. So you'll end up, when you specify the model like this, it automatically generates for you a vector with three parameters. Um, you then need to specify the training objective, like in this case, the squared loss, the quadratic loss, and so it's just y minus y hat squared. And finally, you need to compute the parameters, and it does not do the exact solution like we did. It will follow gradients. So, Torch will do this. It will go downhill by taking little steps. And we'll visit each data point, like each group, small groups of data points, and we'll follow the gradients. And so, we're going to, in the following lecture, we're going to play more with the models. We try to go more linear. We're going to look at statistical problems, things like cross validation and so on. Um, and in the week after, that's when I'm going to spend all the time looking at optimization, gradients, hessians, and how we use optimization to get here or here. Sometimes here is really good too. Uh, so we don't always get to the... But typically your learning problems in reality are like this. They're not balls. Uh, that's what we encounter. Uh, we try to convert them to balls, but... They tend to be like this. All right, thank you very much. No, no, no.